I'd like to personally thank you for tuning in to this broadcast. At Highview Baptist Church, we exist to lead people to know and follow Jesus. We're so thankful that you're taking the time to dig into God's Word with us. And we'd encourage you to check Highview out more on our website at highview.org. We hope and pray that the Lord is speaking to you in and through His Word and that you truly will come to know and follow Jesus. Church, please grab your Bible and turn it to Psalm 139. I mean, it's all things going on. I mean, the perfect kind of text to be in. Psalm 139 in your Bibles, please go ahead and and turn it there. If you're just joining us, we are spending time in the Psalms up until Easter, really in four genres or or categories of Psalms. And the first set, the first three weeks are focused completely on Psalms of worship and adoration. I mean, Psalm 139, absolutely perfect one in this regard. Uh, But I was thinking this week a little bit about times where, you know, in life, you just realize I'm not as good as I thought I was. Like I I should every day, like, man, you know, maybe I like overshot just a little bit. I remember one particular moment in high school when I was a junior during football season, we were in the playoffs and we went to Fort Campbell to play Fort Campbell High School. And they had won, I believe at that time, about four state championships in a row. But I mean, we were about to upset, you know what I'm saying? I mean, it's the year, baby. It takes all of about one snap to realize, you know what? I don't even think we know how to play football. I think we don't, I don't even think we need to be out here on this field. And uh, you just get put in your place. And you know, sometimes in the Bible, there are some passages where you walk away and it's very clear that God is God and you are not. And this is one of those passages that has such high descriptions of God's infinite and eternal nature. I mean, so much so that it's mind boggling. It's incomprehensible in many ways, but yet he's put it before us. And if we receive it rightly, it puts us in our place, but for our good. Because the best place you can possibly be is when you've figured out exactly who God is, because when you know who he is, you recognize who you are and where you ought to be, and it's on your face, bringing him glory. Would you stand with me? We'll read Psalm 139 through verse 16 to begin. <clears throat> David here, the author, of course, of this Psalm, here's what he says, starting in verse one. Oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up, you discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it all together. You hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. Where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me and the light about me be night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is bright as the day for darkness is as light with you. For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them. The days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. Would you pray with me? Lord God, please... Open our eyes to how great you are today that we would leave here with a rightful fear and reverence, but such joy and security because God being infinitely powerful and full of knowledge, you care for us. Lord, thank you for being so gracious. And I pray it in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. 
David has this line in the text where he says, such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high, I cannot attain it. And so I just kind of led with that in terms of the title, kind of focus of our time. This is knowledge that is really too high for us. It's too great for us. We're gonna understand it, but we can't fully comprehend it. Four points I wanna draw out in this passage, which all involve uh, the, the omnis here, if you're familiar with those, except the last one. The first is dealing with God's omniscient being Omniscient God cares for us. Being omnipresent, God leads us graciously. Being omnipotent, God is able to do those things. But ultimately, as we see all of it, though the text doesn't say it, it shouts it and it's of his holiness and being holy, he is worthy. So first, just looking at the first verse, you see the Lord's knowledge as, I mean, completely exhaustive. I'll read it again to you. Oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. And just to be clear from the beginning, we did get it changed this week. It is in all caps this time. You see Lord in the first line of your last week, all caps. It may say in your translation, Jehovah, or sometimes pronounced Yahweh. We're not just talking about any God. I just wanna remind us of that. We're talking about the God of Israel, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We are talking about God revealed most fully in Jesus Christ. He has searched us and known us. If you're not familiar with those words, omniscient, omnipresent, the prefix omni means all or every. And in this case, niscient is from a word called gnosis, which means knowledge. And so to say omniscient is to say God is, he knows everything. He is all knowing and his knowledge is perfect and complete. And you get a taste of it in the text in the first several verses. In verse two, David says, you know, when I sit down and when I rise up, God, you know what I'm gonna do before I do it. You discern my thoughts from afar. God, you know what I'm gonna think before I think it. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. God, you know my patterns, my idiosyncrasies. You know my disciplines. You know what I'm like, verse four, even before a word is on my tongue. Behold, O Lord, you know it all together. God, you know what I'm going to say before I say it. He is omniscient. But let's not leave it abstract Let's kind of press that because certainly David, when he says, oh Lord, you've searched and known me, he doesn't just mean him. This is true of every single person in this room or every single person that's ever lived or anything in God's creation period for that matter. He has searched it and he has known it. This is poetic because he doesn't have to search it because his knowledge is immediate, but we get the point. God's knowledge is exhaustive. It is complete. You see a taste of that in those first four verses. There is nothing that God does not know or does not understand. And what's even crazier is that in all God's knowledge, it's simultaneous. You see, you and I, we might say, hey, hold that thought. I'm not ready for that yet. Don't bring that to my desk yet. I've got to work on this because our thoughts are sequential. We can only handle handle a few at once, but that's not like God's knowledge. He knows everything exhaustively and completely, and he does so immediately in the moment, simultaneously, he understands it. For every single person in this room, he knows what you're thinking right now. He knows what you're desiring. He knows how many hairs are on your head, how many white blood cells are in your body, while at the same time in the farthest reaches of the earth, he's pondering and thinking about the deepest creature in the Marianas Trench that no human eye can see. All the while he's tracking every single asteroid in the universe, in its orbit, in its path, and knows its elemental composition, and he knows it at once. And if that's not enough, he doesn't just know it in the present tense. He knows everything perfectly in the past and everything perfectly in the future. It's exhaustive, it's complete, it's perfect. And it's the kind of knowledge that is wisdom. It's not just exhaustive. It's a knowledge that is full of wisdom. It's a perfect kind of knowledge and discernment and understanding because you and I, sometimes we have information, but we don't get it. That's me a lot of the time with a lot of things, especially, you know, if I get Ikea instructions to assemble furniture, I have the information, but based upon by the time I'm done, the blood, the sweat, and the tears, and the conflict in my household, I clearly didn't get it, okay? I don't understand it. God's not like that. How often when you process a thought, are you stressed? How often when you receive information, does it take you aback or you're confused by it? Or you're saying, hold on, I've got to think about that a minute. Not the Lord. 
His knowledge is a knowledge that's always in a position of rest. He's never stressed. There's always a perfect understanding, but here is what is most remarkable. Oh Lord, verse one, you have searched me and known me. It's personal. It doesn't, it isn't just as if David shows up and says, hey, God searched everything and knows everything. He says, he knows me. He doesn't just know your stats. He knows your soul. Maybe you feel that no one understands you or people misunderstand you or people don't understand your story or people don't understand certain things about you. Maybe you struggle and I don't even understand myself. Why am I like this? The Lord knows and understands you perfectly and he cares for you. Because the fact that he does search you and know you would indicate your very value. We're no, we all know the phrase, hey, don't give it a second thought. We say that when something is so non-important, you're like, hey, don't waste your time thinking about that anymore. Think about this. The God of the heavens is searching you, thinking about you all the time. Not just you, but everyone, everywhere, everything, everywhere, even in the mundane things. Look at verse two. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. This is why Paul can say, do everything, even drinking a glass of water for the glory of God is because everything's up under his hand and his knowledge. And because God is thinking and searching everything, that means everything has value. That means every moment has value. Even when you're sitting in your car, even when you sit down in your chair at work or when you rise up from your bed in the morning and you're half conscious trying to figure out why am I having to wake up right now? God, that moment is important to him. And you know, sometimes God lets us experience that, the meaningful nature of a moment. When you pray something and God in a really crazy way answers a prayer and you just like, whoa. Or maybe you meet a stranger or through seeming random circumstances, your paths cross with someone and there's so many seemingly random factors that take place, but all of a sudden, next thing you know, based on what's happening in the conversation or encouragement or information that's shared, or maybe someone gives their life to Christ and in that moment, you realize all that's happened and the hair stands up on the back of your neck. You say, whoa, that was a providence of God. He's giving you a taste of his transcendence. But what you have to understand, considering God's knowledge is of all things of all the time, sometimes he lets you taste it. But you have to know, even when you don't recognize it, every moment's that way. There is not a single moment that is not valuable where he is not in his kingdom working forward with his redemptive purpose. He is perfectly knowledgeable in his nature. He has decreed all things. Every moment is perfect. And if you begin to think about this the way God knows you, the first thing it causes is fear. Because we all know what it's like when you hit that pocket dial and next thing you know, you're leaving a 12 minute voicemail and you see it on your phone and you know, you're shutting it off and you're having to do the instant replay and you're asking, well, hey, what all did I say? You know, how much did I say? Because we know we're evil. Why well, would we be nervous about what we said? We know and, and we get nervous when somebody knows a lot about us. There's such a thing as blackmail. There's such a thing of, of someone, you know, uh, ruining our reputation. That's very scary. And here it is, the God of the universe knows everything about you. And that should produce a good and rightful fear because in his knowledge, his knowledge is perfect and his justice is perfect. And every single person in this room is guilty and he knows it. But here's what's amazing. Look at verse five. What does God do in his perfect knowledge? But care for us. You hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It's high, I cannot attain it. That God, you know me perfectly, but what you wanna treat me with is your grace and all that you know about me. And that begins obviously, as God says, you, you, know, you know, as the scripture says, you hem me in behind and before of God's deliverance of us. If there's something that's very clear in the New Testament, it is that Jesus is omniscient. I mean, we could talk about it a hundred times. Remember Nathaniel? Hey, Nathaniel, I knew you when you were under the fig tree. And Nathaniel's like, dude, that's crazy. He's like, you're impressed by that? You know, you think that's a big deal? You, Jesus is described in the book of Revelation as having eyes like flames of fire. It's because he searches every soul. He knows everything. 
You see it in the woman in the, at the well in, in John chapter four is he approaches her and she tells him in her, in her broken life, you know, I don't have a husband. And Jesus says, that's right. That's because you've had five husbands. He knew, but yet he brought it out to care for her. He knows, and yet he still wants to show you mercy. So fear him, but realize where the fear is to lead you. It's to lead you to him for forgiveness. Because Jesus knew everything that you were ever going to do, every sin you would ever commit, every sin you would commit after your salvation. And knowing all that before you were born, he still went to the cross and out of his great love, paid the penalty for your sin. If there is anything that is an affirmation of Jesus's unconditional love for us, it is his omniscience because he knows everything and he still did it, which tells us it has nothing to do with us. It has everything to do with his kindness and his mercy. He, in knowledge of you, died at the cross, paying the penalty for sinners, is alive and with his knowledge of you says, come to me. And believing in him, he will forgive you. He knows. You're not hiding from him. And not just does he want to save you through faith, but he wants to care for you. You hem me in behind and before God, you protect me from behind what's in my past. God, you protect me from what's in front of me in my future and in the present tense, you're laying your hand upon me. I immediately thought of the Red Sea. The Israelites pinned by the Egyptian army at the back, the sea in front of them, they thought they were dead. But what they thought was their death was the place of their deliverance because the hand of the Lord was on them. And you must trust this, that in relationship with Christ, he's hemmed you in behind and before. And sometimes the place you think is the greatest pickle, he's about to do something awesome. He cares for us. It's too high for us. This is clearly what we would call an incommunicable attribute of God. No one has this kind of knowledge. This is reserved to God alone. But not just does he know everything, He's present everywhere and everything. And let's just make a distinction in God's omnipresence. It's not that he is part of his creation. He is separate from his creation, yet he is present in every point of his creation. And that is an important distinction because the universe is not God. Sometimes people say, I believe everything is God. No, it's not. God is God and God is separate from his creation, but he is present in his creation. David says, where shall I go from your spirit? In verse seven. Or where shall I flee from your presence? If I send to heaven, you're there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. David clearly doesn't want to flee God's presence, but this entire Psalm is one of poetry. It's a poetic statement. Is there anywhere I could go, God, where you are not present? Clearly the answer is no. Omnipresent means he is present everywhere all the time. And again, this ought to produce a fear of the Lord. There is nowhere you can go. There's nowhere you can hide. There's nowhere you can escape. There is nowhere you can flee ever. You can't conceal anything from him because he doesn't just know he's present. Sometimes I've heard people blasphemously say, you know what? I don't wanna have anything to do with God. I would rather be in hell. Well, that's gonna be a horrible spot because God is present there too. That is why hell is hell, right? It's because God is present there, eternally bringing judgment upon those who've rejected him. Revelation 14 says, the smoke of their torment will rise up before the presence of the lamb forever. There is nowhere, not even in death, where you can escape the presence of God. It's not just that when you and I sin, that God is aware of it. He is there. You know, there are so many things that we would not do if someone was watching or someone was present. And the scripture is telling us that Jesus is here. Always. And that is fearful. But the good news is with his presence, he's come for redemption. In his presence, he's not come to bring condemnation, though it would be rightful, but he's come to bring salvation. 
Verse nine, you see these gracious purposes of the Lord's leadership with his presence. David says, if I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. If I go as far from any human eye or human presence that I could possibly go to the farthest reaches of the earth, God, you are still there with me. You are still there leading me, being kind to me, gracious to me. Maybe you even find yourself in a position like that today. You know that you, you love the Lord, but you have been trying to flee from him. You're not, <laughs> didn't work. Jonah tried to do that and he actually found himself more emphatically in the presence of God in a fish than he was before he left. Then he sped him back on shore and said, go do your job, right? Even there, God is gracious. When you have fled from him, he says, come, I want to lead you graciously. And then there's clearly moments of seeming hopelessness or suffering where verse 11, I've already read it today. Surely the darkness shall cover me and the light about me be night. God, I'm suffering. God, I'm in affliction. God, I'm being opposed. It seems like there is no hope. Even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is bright as the day for darkness is as light with you. I read that and I thought about Joseph in Genesis. Sold into slavery Everything's going wrong. Things are going a little better, but then he's falsely accused of adultery that he didn't do, but he's placed in prison, even in his righteousness, placed in prison and for years there. But the text tells you the Lord was with Joseph. The Lord was with Joseph. The Lord was with Joseph. And we need to hear that today. So many, all of us need to hear it, but especially some, you feel covered in darkness because of your situation right now. And you need to know the Lord is with you and he's not abandoned you. And what is dark to you is light to him. And he's with you. He will not forsake you. It's the very promise of the new covenant that we are sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, which is the guarantee of our inheritance when Jesus returns. It's what Jesus said, not just for moments of suffering, but for moments of mission Behold, I'm with you. He says, go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Behold, I'm with you until the end of the age. Jesus is the one who is with us. There is no place you can go. There's no suffering that you can endure. There's no adversary that you face. There is no place in the world, even if it is the darkest pit of hell, that the Lord Jesus is not there and present, working his purposes in his kingdom for the glory of his name and for the holiness of your life. He will never forsake you because his love is for you. And he takes it a step further because he doesn't just tell us that God's knowledge is perfect and that God's presence are perfect to him us in and to lead us, but he tells us he's powerful enough to do it. God is omnipotent, which means that he is all powerful. It means that he can do anything he pleases that is compatible with his attributes. Meaning God will never do something that is unrighteous. God can do and will do as he pleases anything he wants. Nothing is too hard for the Lord. And David really presses into that in verse 13. He says, for you formed my inward parts. And now he's talking about creation. There's, no, there's nothing really where God's power is more first demonstrated in the origin of life itself. That he spoke, there was nothing and he spoke and there was everything. For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. This is the grounding first of why God can hem us in, why God can lead us graciously is because he is powerful enough to do it. For you form my inward parts, but this is also the grounding of why he cares for you in the first place. Because he did make you. He made you. As an act of his love and kindness and his care, he made you. Not just as physical matter, he made you with a soul. You for my inward parts. God in all of his power, I mean, who made the sun, who made Jupiter, who made the expansive nature of the sea, yet his power isn't just some kind of brute force, but it's delicate. And all of his power, he comes and knits together every muscle, every neural pathway, everything. Knits you together 
in your mother's womb. And what does it lead to? Well, a verse we're very familiar with, but I would maybe put before you that this is more about God than it is about us. I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Look at what he says first, I praise you. That verse isn't primarily about us. That verse is primarily about God, but it is about us. We have value because of him. We are wonderful because he's wonderful. I praise you for I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. If you're back with us at Christmas, that's that same word, wonderful counselor for Jesus. It's that same word. Is anything too wonderful for God? Is anything too hard for God? It's the same word. What's supposed to happen to you when you dwell upon God's creation of you is you are to be left in an utter amazement that he cared enough to make you and that he didn't just make you, but he made you incredibly, wonderfully, knitting you together. You see the power and the tenderness of the Lord. And then in verse 15, my frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. You know, I don't even know exactly what that means. I don't know if David did either. (laughs) But he's putting before us in the most poetic kind of way that God, he's the source. He was there. When no one else was there, he was there. You know, we all love an origin story. You can see it in books. You can see it at the movie theaters. You can see it when people say, hey, 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 listen, I I knew that person before they were famous, right? I knew that musical artist before they went big. Hey, I was there when the building was built. Why do we love that so much? We love origin story. This is the ultimate origin story. And there is only one who can take glory for it. And it's God Almighty. But here's the most astounding verse maybe in the chapter. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. David said, when there was nothing of physical matter, God saw you, knew you, loved you then. In your non-existence, in your pre-existence because you and I began not simply as matter. We began as a creative thought in the mind of God. It's Sanctity of Life Sunday next week, but today's Sanctity of Life Sunday too, right now, okay? And most of the time, We hear this verse, you form my inward parts, you knitted me together in my mother's womb, I'm fearfully and wonderfully made, and rightfully so. David demonstrates to us what we already know in this room is true, is that life begins at the moment of conception. It does. But I would say the strongest case for the value of life is not even in verse 13, but it's in verse 16. Because what we're reading is that he saw our unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. When did your value begin? This isn't a matter of biology even. Your value began before you ever existed because he wrote the book. He orchestrated life. It was in his mind and he actualized it the moment he spoke you into existence. All of your days were already written. Your start date, your expiration date and everything in between, God has in his sovereign governance orchestrated your value began then. So for us to take a step back and understand life truly, we know this that any kind of opposition to any life whatsoever is to a great degree, even a greater abomination because life didn't just begin in the womb, it began before then in the mind of God. So to take life from the womb or to diminish life at an old age 
or to speak against someone's life with a curse or to devalue anyone anywhere who bears the image of God is not an affront primarily to man. It's an affront to the creator, God of the universe, who is the author of life. He has provided this value that we have. He has written your days. He's the one who knits you together in your mother's womb. He has perfect knowledge, perfect presence, perfect power. He is perfectly, eternally, infinitely, incomprehensibly glorious in every way. And what's even greater is his name is Jesus. This is not a distant God from us, but one in all of his transcendence is imminent. He is near. He is not just simply spoken and acted. He has taken on flesh and died for your sin. How much more, the father giving his only son, will he not love you now that you belong to him, hemming you in behind him before, leading you graciously in his presence, supplying everything you need because he knows you're not able, but his grace is sufficient in your weakness. So what do you do with that? You worship God. The word has not been used, but it's been felt, hasn't it? Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. David and God's holiness demonstrates to us the only response is worship. It's jealousy for his name. How precious to me are your thoughts, O oh God. How vast is the sum of them. David, I can't handle this, Lord. This is too much, okay? This is like the sand. If I could count them, they are more than the sand. You know, <clears throat> as I read this this week, I really think to a great degree, verses 17 and 18 are the indicator of why David was considered a man after God's own heart. How precious to me are your thoughts, O God. This is a man who was consumed more with the thoughts of God than the thoughts of his own mind. I would put before you that one of the greatest things that characterizes the difference between someone who walks in the spirit and someone who walks in the flesh is whose thoughts that you dwell on. That's what Romans 8 says. The mind set on the flesh is hostile to God. That's the question. Whose thoughts are you more focused upon? Who, whose thoughts am I more focused upon? My thoughts? My sense of fairness? My perception of reality? My sense of right and wrong? Or God's? And you know how we can examine and find out if God's thoughts are precious to us? You're gonna be shocked when I say this. <laughs> It's whether or not that this book consumes you every day of your life. Amen. That you read it, that you dwell upon it, you memorize it, and you ponder it. Because in that, you have the thoughts, the very word of God revealing his nature, revealing truth, revealing his decrees. He is truth. And in all of this knowledge, David says, I awake and I'm still with you. That's what's, again, remarkable. In all of God's thoughts, again, he's not distant from us. David says, there's never a moment you're not with me. I'll wake, even in my most vulnerable state, my state of sleep, I'll wake up and you're still there caring for me. And might we just take it a step farther and recognize this, even in the sleep of death, for the believer in Jesus Christ, you awake and you are still with him. Even in death, you will never be lost from him. To be absent from the body is to be present with him. And there is a shift and turn right here that's probably gonna startle us. But it's really the natural and logical conclusion of develop, dwelling on who God is as the author of life. Oh, that you would slay the wicked, oh God. Oh, men of blood, depart from me. They speak against you with malicious intent. Your enemies take your name in vain. Do I not hate those who hate you, O Lord? And do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with complete hatred. I count them as my enemies. There's a tension, isn't there? Because we just read in the Sermon on the Mount, 
Jesus said, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Is this okay? Is the Bible in somehow in contradiction? There's tensions in the Bible that you cannot relieve without disobeying the Lord or denying truth. There are tensions that exist and this is one of them. Because the reality is we are called to love our enemies and pray for those who persecute us. In the sense that always being God oriented, we pray for those who hurt us, even those who have done worse than us, we bless them, we care for them. And most importantly, we compassionately seek their salvation through the sharing of the gospel. We long for them to be reconciled to God. We would never take a personal vengeance against anyone. We would never retaliate against anyone. That vengeance, that justice belongs to God alone. But at the same time, you know, even in your own heart is an image bearer of God. If you love him and you love holiness, there is a longing for justice that exists within you that simultaneously occurs. And David here, as he says, do I not hate those who hate you, Lord? Do I not loathe those who rise up against you? Is just recognizing this reality. Yes, we love our enemies, but at the same time, we are provoked by evil. And this is one of the great problems, even of the Bible Belt South, that there are too many people indifferent to righteousness and tolerant of wickedness. We are to hate evil, not in a personal vendetta, vengeance kind of way. We're entrusting all these things to the justice of God. Nonetheless, if someone came up to you in the parking lot after church and began to curse your children and to curse your wife and you weren't provoked, you don't love them. Are we provoked by evil? But again, even in our provocation, there's a missional response, is there not? Because what do you do when someone hates the Lord? You tell them about the one who loves them. You tell them about the one who wants to reconcile them and forgive their sin. We know David's desire is a holy one because of the way he ends. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. See if there be any grievous way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. This isn't personal in terms of his own feelings. Toward, this is about his worship of the Lord and how he's viewing the world. And he shows that this isn't so much a personal agenda, but a God glorifying agenda of jealousy for the Lord by the fact that he says, Lord, search me. That's how he ends this thing. God, if there's a wicked area of my life, if I'm doing something that's displeasing to you, change me, show me, make me different, God. And that has to be our prayer as we leave. As we look at all of these things of God's character, you have to ask, where Am I not trusting him? Where am I not believing him? Where am I not receiving his grace and worshiping him as the God that he is? And the greatest way a person could leave today is to say, I've been rejecting the one who is omniscient, omnipresent, omnipotent, and holy. I'm guilty, yet the Lord invites you in by grace. The one who died for your sin, believe in him for the forgiveness of sin. Would you pray with me? Father, we have talked about so many things, weighty things, big things, bigger than our minds can understand. And Lord, my words are so short. Your word's perfect. Lord, erase anything that I've said that it's not for your glory and honor yourself in our hearts and minds and bring us to a worship of you that is appropriate according to your glory. Lord Jesus, thank you for who you are. Thank you for your salvation in your name. Amen.